Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're not just studying 2 Corinthians. We're studying the weapons of our warfare for ministry in the local assembly. How could anything be more critical than that? It's early on. It's in this first foundational edifice, Romans. And it has to do with a local assembly functioning in the ministry, uh, in the power of the Lord's might. That would be what? Strong in grace. And these weapons have to do with grace and how to handle difficulties in the ministry. Um, weapons of warfare, are, is that a battle? Yeah. Question is, with who? Right? With who? And we've identified that. We've seen that it's the sum that are at Corinth, that are unrepentant, and they glory in appearance, unlike what we read in the previous chapter, which, what's one of the weapons? Previous chapter, what's the weapon? I'll hand out those charts again when we need to. Pardon? Inner man. What do you need to gain? You need to gain mercy, but what do you got to do to ha what do you got to do to uh, what do you got to do with um, having received mercy? You got to have the inner man. You got to be built up in the inner man. What we were just talking about, getting the doctrine down in your soul. Okay, the inner man is one of the weapons of our warfare. Okay, so what we looked at was uh, chapter five. We're looking at another weapon of our warfare. What is that? What's that chart say, Jill? The love of Christ for ministry. Well, we looked at these first chapters. What is that about? Well, when loved ones die, where do they go? They go to be with the Lord. Do they receive new bodies? Not yet. Not yet. But we're to know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. What does that mean, absent from the body, present with the Lord? It means you can no longer function down here on the earth, does it not? The window of opportunity to serve the Lord and build a capacity to praise, honor, and glorify Him is over in terms of gaining a capacity, which is gained here. In this crucible, in these present sufferings, in this evil day, where the ministry is about, and that's what we're going to look at, the ministry of reconciliation. Craig's making a thing for me, uh, 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 a graphic for me on, uh, on six different reconciliations that you find in the Bible. Okay, And we're going to use that as kind of a backdrop. It's an opportunity to learn some things about terminology. And it's generic until applied to a context. Okay. Context, you need the context to know what kind of reconciliation it is. But the point is, if you're absent from the body, you're with him, and what are you waiting for? A new body. That's what we learn, right? When we get to verse 9, whether we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be what? Well, if we're present with him, is our labor over? If we're still here, is our labor over? You see how Paul's what, what the Lord's doing here? He's saying, when you lose a loved one, their opportunity, they've graduated to his presence. But you're still here. Why does he leave us here in this present suffering? Why? To build the church, the body of Christ. Right? To bring them to the Lord with the ministry of reconciliation and to build them up in the truth what we were talking about a little bit this morning with Martha and Mary. Um, notice, he says, wherefore we, I want you to notice that, wherefore we do what? Labor. doesn't say work. What's labor mean? Labor's a little stronger than work, isn't it? Labor's a little stronger because it is a labor, isn't it? And you have the inner man to be ex have that labor accepted. Otherwise, it could be done in the strength of the flesh under the law, could it not? Right? That's why the battle in the ministry is not just for the lost. The battle in the ministry is to what? Win the saved to the truth 
of how to serve God. It's not a joke. It's not a it's not capricious. It's not, oh well, they're saved. Then it would say that the will of the Lord is that all men do what? Be saved and what? Nothing. Just get saved. But we're not left here to just get saved and go on our merry way with our worldly things and judge everything by appearance. That's not what he does. You think it's any less important that we come to a knowledge of the truth? How can we function for others in the ministry of reconciliation and in the ministry if we don't grow in the truth? We can't. Without that inner man, how far are you going to get developing your capacity to glorify him for all eternity? How far are you going to get? You shall be saved, but as if by... You know, one day that's going to be manifest and revealed. It's not a joke. It's not a game. You know, you don't have to listen to folks too long to see what they're concerned about and what they're careful for. You don't have to. I don't use that as an opportunity to critique. I use that as an opportunity to know what to do for saints. How to encourage them, to beg them, to beseech them. Paul goes on to say here, for, and this makes sense, right? We must be accepted of him. Our, our deeds, our service, is it going to be accepted of him when our conduct and service is evaluated? It's put in real simple terms in Colossians, whether they be good or whether they be what? Whether it's in his goodness or whether it's in your own strength, that be bad. <laughs> because profitless. What's one of the four faithful sayings? Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. We're talking about profit here. There's nothing wrong with profit. <laughs> Secularly, in this society, there is something wrong with profit, isn't there? You can only have this much. How much? You can only have this much. You can only have this much. You can only have this much. <laughs> Bread lines. <laughs> We're talking about profit above and beyond, literally above. What's real? This is temporal. That's real. Not vice versa. Um, Paul says, For we must all uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and every one may receive the things done in body according to that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or bad. Under grace or under the law. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, what do we know? Ye shall be saved, but as if by what? And not only that, what about the lost? Are they going to experience the terror of the Lord? It's a terrible thing to be in the hands of the living God. That's why we labor. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Um, I'm going to move along here and get to where we were. Uh, it says, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Notice in the previous verse, the Apostle Paul, he says, I want you to, in your midst, you have the sum who govern what they do on the basis of appearance. Okay? And he says here, I want you to have an answer for them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Okay, They don't have the inner man stored up in their soul. And he says, here's the attack that they're making on Paul. It's in the next verse. It's in 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. What are they saying about Paul? The apostle Paul is crazy. He's got his priorities all messed up. He's crazy. Um, last week we saw what the sum glory in. 
Okay? And it's not our message. It's not our message. It's not the message of grace. What is it? Or the ministration of grace, which remaineth, did not fade away, as we were talking about yesterday, Jill. What do the some glory in? Appearance. Things that are seen. They're looking at Paul and they're saying, nobody behaves like that and suffers the consequences of what they do and don't stop. Right? Um, we saw that. They're just the opposite. I'm not going to go over that again in Galatians chapter 6. Why will they not stand for God's grace lest they suffer what? And what do they constrain you to do? I want you to take two words, same word, and look at them as they're applied in Scripture to the sum and to the faithful at Corinth. Look at Galatians 6. As Paul writes to the Galatians, where there are those teaching the law for righteousness, and we know, Romans 10, 4, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Do we not? And it says here, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. What have they got going on? A little carny show, right? Performance, compliance to their dictates. And in this case, it's circumcision, okay? Which is part of what? The site program in time past under the law. Notice he says, they constrain. See that word constrain right there? How do they constrain? You to be circumcised. How do they constrain? With what? Works for righteousness. They constrain by your flesh performing for them. Uh, some of you probably have similar experiences. Uh, maybe not, but I know when I was coming along, there was this question of water baptism, so I asked some of the older saints. I said, well, should, why should I get water baptized? You know why I didn't like it? Because I saw it in denominationalism. I experienced it. And I thought, really? We do the same thing they do? That's the appearance of it. And why are we doing it? All these questions I had, right? And the guy said, Christ was water baptized. I follow Christ. Therefore, I got water baptized. Does that sound good? Sounded sound pretty good to me. Did I do it? Nah, I, I wasn't a ritualistic ceremonial guy. And I said, no, nah, you, know, you know what? I wasn't persuaded in my mind, even though I didn't know much. It's just, no. I'm not dancing like a monkey on a hot plate for them. That's kind of how I felt, right? I don't understand why you got to do it. It hasn't been explained to me. That reasoning right there is kind of like the political science teacher, you know, and he says, let's see. All radicals have brown hair. You got brown hair, you're a radical. Okay? And it's not going to work for me, right? Because what? That summation right there, it's based on what? A Exactly, Don. Exactly. Outward appearance. So they constrain with works, don't they? So they can glory in their flesh. I told you the story a thousand times about the Northwest Bible Baptist Church down the street where the guy came in and said, how many people have you baptized? That he's mad because people were accidentally coming to our church. And he says, how many people have you water baptized in your church? And I go, Ooh. first of all, you're kind of go, Ooh. <laughs> I thought he was coming to church. <laughs> and I said, none. And he said, I baptized a thousand people. That's this verse right here. This past year. Is that this verse? Could everybody see that? Do you need the inner man to know what's going on? No, that complied with what everybody does. And you know, everybody does that here. <laughs> Be persuaded where? Fully in your what? mind. They want you to dance around for their dictates. And we're not under the law today. And the Holy Spirit will never lead you that way through the Word of God. 
Note here, the word constrain you to be circumcised. Why is the reason they're doing this? Lest they what? Suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Why are they doing it that way? They will not suffer for the Lord. Suffering, as they gauge it by appearance, is just a lesson never to do it again. Why was Paul crazy? Because he suffered and what happened? He did it again and again and again and again. What would you surmise? He's a masochist. Wouldn't you? If you judge things by appearance. By appearance, Paul's crazy. By heart, Paul's crazy for God. That's a different thing, isn't it? To be crazy for God. Look at 2 Corinthians 12.10. 2 Corinthians 12.10. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians 12, look at verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my, Paul's suffering, physically. For my strength is made perfect in what? When your flesh suffers, what happens to the inner man? Though the outward man perishes, the chapter 4, the inner man what? Is renewed day by day, okay? And Paul says, I'm made perfect through the weakness. No, you're crazy. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Would that be a masochist? No. No. Appearance-wise, it looks like it, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You know, like, all of a sudden, Paul's preaching the gospel, and somebody starts screaming and yelling, and soldiers come, and cops come, you know? Uh, what does everybody do at the memorial service? Whoa! I don't want any of that guy stink on me! Right? I've seen it. Right? It's the truth of it. So, we read here, Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, and necessities, in persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? The inner man. And I can discern what's crazy and what's crazy for God. And crazy for God is, as far as believers are concerned, that have what? The inner man stored up in their heart, who they are in Christ. It's not crazy, it's sober. It's a sober response to who he's made us in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.14, and you're going to see this word constrain again. Okay, that's how the religious constrain. The religious, saved or unsaved? How do the faithful constrain? Take a look at verse 14. For the love of Christ does what? Constraineth us. We're not constrained by fear to perform in our own strength. We're constrained by the power of his great love for us. The gospel that we preach. We're saved from the terror of the Lord and his wrath on ungodliness and right, unrighteousness, right? Um, the sufferings of Christ. Let, let's put it this way. The sum, let's simplify it. The sum constrain your flesh to perform for them. Okay? We're to constrain the saints by his work performed for them. Are we not? We're to exalt his performance, not ours. The sufferings of Christ in us commends, approves our ministry. That's, that's a sober response to what Paul's going through. Gives evidence of it. Philippians, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. Paul says in 6.17, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he count those sufferings? The evidence of his Savior and him functioning in the strength of his grace, his performance on the cross of Calvary for him. 
Uh, take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.13. We might seem crazy to those among you who glory in appearance and walk by sight. They're not able to discern our activity, our conduct, uh, because they don't walk according to the power of God. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 4, and 5, that's where Paul starts with these guys. If you notice that, go back there. This is one of my favorite passages. 1 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 to establish a saint. Paul says in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in my speech and my preaching was not with man's, with what not, uh, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That'd be the inner man and the strength of the inner man, where you discern from. And what in reality appears to be crazy to them is sobriety to you and for your benefit in Christ. Paul says, as a father, I have begotten you in Christ. And that's where these Corinthians are loved, by the apostle that taught them and instructed them. Okay, We're to be crazy to the lost. I mean, that's been my experience. Don't they think you're kind of nuts? Why? Well, they don't know anything about the Word of God. They just know about the behavior of the saints, generally speaking. What's the behavior of the saints, generally speaking? Not too good. Is it? Covenant theology? Is that a good thing? Is that a terrible apostate doctrine that will destroy you and your service and conduct for the Lord? How many of the church's function according to covenant theology think they're spiritual Israel? Bringing in a kingdom on the earth. We, could, we have a long list. We have a long list. Um, Second Corinthians 4.18 While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Do you see how that, you go from that verse and it gets picked up again in verse 12 in Second Corinthians chapter 5? See that? Who glory in appearance? They're void of the truth. They have no discernment. And that makes us look crazy to them. But not to you guys. But not to you Corinthians. God, the Son's performance for us, paying what the justice of God demanded, His wrath and terror on our sins, it fell on Christ. Did it not? That terror fell on Christ. And that's exactly what it says in Romans 15, verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. <laughs> that wrath fell on him. If possible, Lord, Father, take this cup from me. But thy will be done. Was the cup taken from him? That cup of wrath, indignation? It was poured on him. It fell on him. Okay? Now, I'm going to introduce something here. I want you to take a verse that's in Romans and apply it to what follows here in this chapter of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And that verse is Romans 3.22. Okay, You guys know what that passage says. Romans 3.22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, The, the, the righteousness of God today is revealed apart from the law, is it not? Without the law. That means the right way of dealing with sin is not the way they dealt with it in time past. The right way of dealing with sin is by the faith of Jesus Christ, who did the work because we couldn't. And his performance satisfied the justice of God. That's what these passages are going on to say. As, as we see, you know, this sentence here from verse 21 all the way to 26 transpire. Um, but Romans 3.22 goes on to say this. 
by faith of Jesus Christ, and then it goes like this, unto all. Okay. All men. Do we have an all man message? All nations? Any nation more prominent than another nation before God? The souls in that nation? Any soul more prominent than another soul to God? Did he not die for all men? He died for all. Unto all. What's the qualifier? Upon all them that believe. Now Paul's going to do this in the rest of the chapter with that. Okay? Um, take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Let's see. The love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Did he die for every son and daughter of Adam? Time passed. Ages to come. He died for them all. And if believed, are all dead to the flesh? Notice he says, were. He says, if one died for all, then we're all what? Now here's what this, you go, I don't get that. Then we're all dead. It means this, and it's in, it's in the next two passages. And that he died for all, that they which should live, that they which should live, should not henceforth live unto themselves. He died for all, okay, unto all. That they which should live should not henceforth live unto themselves. That's upon all. Those are the ones that live for Christ, right? Not to themselves anymore. And walk, operate by appearance and sight. It says, henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's who we're going to live to. We trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to pay for our sins. So he died for all. And those that believe don't live to themselves anymore. They have to have the capacity to discern above and beyond appearance. For heaven's sakes, we say. Wherefore, henceforth, I'll read 15 again, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, okay, wherefore the therefore, and from now on, and from now on, know we no man after the flesh. Now go back to verse 14. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. How do we look at the sons and daughters of Adam that are unsaved, the lost? Come on. What? No, we don't. No, we don't. What happens when you preach the gospel to somebody, for the most part? What do they give you? Works. Do they start telling you their works? How they earned heaven? Why? Because they think you've got to work your way to heaven. So they start giving you their works. Are we to have any regard for their works? That's what 14 means. And if one died for all, then we're all dead. Do we look at folks in the flesh, the unsaved? Do we count their works for anything? We want to get them off of that agenda and get the religious agenda and get them on what? We want to talk about his work and his performance, not ours. We don't want to talk about your performance. We henceforth, they're all, if Christ died for all, then we don't look at anybody in the flesh anymore, do we? Because God doesn't count it for righteousness. Some perverted, evolved works that they're involved with that come from the time past uh, agency of blessing, Israel. And that's what it is. Twisted, perverted system of works that religion constrains them to comply with in order that they be part of the group. The group. And believe the word of man. Because they certainly aren't reading out of the Bible to get that. Don started talking about right division. Right division is Romans 9, 10, and 11. Is that enough right division for you? The former agency of blessing has what? Fallen. And what's risen? 
The church, the body of Christ, made up of the nations. Paul's an apostle to the nations. The agency of blessing is made up of individuals amongst all the nations. Okay. And manifested all over the world as little points of light. Uh, Bush didn't know what he was saying when he said that. Maybe he did. That's local assemblies. Right? Manifesting locally the truth of God and what he's doing today. So the Apostle Paul here, he's saying, this is what I want you to get out of these passages. He's saying, don't look at anybody in the strength of their flesh anymore. If he died for all, then we're all, then, then it goes on in 14, it says, then we're all dead. Everybody. And we're to look at him as dead. Note, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. That about says it, doesn't it? Do we recognize the works of the flesh today? We do not. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. Do we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like I said earlier, where that man said, Christ got baptized, I follow Christ, so I'm getting water baptized. Would that contradict what we read right here? Oh, if only I knew that passage when he, when he said it and I could explain it, which I couldn't. Henceforth, do we know Christ anymore after the flesh? Nope. We're constrained and we judge and discern with a godly conscience. Romans 3.22 is foundational to the discussion here, unto all and upon all. It's foundational here. And that he died for all, we read, right? In 16, unto all, we know no man after the works of the flesh, religion. Whether it's in or out of a formal religion. Anyone who thinks by his own moral merits trying to reach their way to heaven. Notice 16 says, for we know. Wherefore, henceforth, know we. We know something. We're not to recognize any man after the flesh. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, who can quote it? Let's try it one time all the way through. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The faith didn't come from you. It had an object, okay? Okay. It's a gift. You didn't do it. Why would I want to listen to your works? What are religious people going to tell you when you share the gospel with them? And they're all religion, whether they're running every day, you know, and they worship their bodies and exercise and diet. Think about the focus of this culture today. It's totally off anything that matters. If I was a worm and I was eating a dead body, I want a fat one over a skinny one. I'm joking. I know. I, I understand. I mean, I'm getting older. I understand the issues. There's nothing wrong. You know, usually if you just function, I mean, I always did, you know, you're going to be fine, right? But there's religions going out there today, and it's not sitting at a church, but it's all about performance, isn't it? People evaluate you, and you look at them, and you see them, and they're evaluating, and their discernment is the sum. They gauge everything by appearance. And is that a mistake in life? What will that get you? The terror of the Lord. That's what it'll get you. Don't be a fool. Be crazy for God. And sober to those that have the inner man and can discern a thing the way God looks at a thing and be like-minded in Christ. We're not to look at Christ after the flesh. I'll finish up with this, this little thing here, this segment here. Look at Romans 15. We won't acknowledge works when we preach our, uh, the gospel, will we? And we'll try to get him on what? He's going to recompense to you according to your works, all right? And not the good ones you're talking about, but the ones that are on the videotape that maybe no one saw or maybe people have seen. Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the what? 
Well, we're not to constrain people to be circumcised. We read in Galatians 6, verse 16, didn't we? So, if he was a minister to the circumcision, was every male Jew to be circumcised? Well, that would be them. The former agency of blessing in time past. That's who he was sent to. In Matthew through what? Acts chapter 7. Right? He was sent to them. Now, uh, it says here in 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That would be not just Abraham, who's our father also, but what? Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob's the father of the... That's why he's called Israel. Now here's the thing. In time past, it says in John 4.22, salvation of the Jews was with the Abrahamic covenant still in place. They were still his spiritual people in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he came to them, not to you. What did he do when a Gentile petitioned him? I would... I'm not sent only to the circumcision, right? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what did he do? He walked right past them. Why? The agency of blessing was the one that brought it to the Gentiles, not the, the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the religious today, they would say they know Christ after the flesh. Let's put it this way. They think they do. Christ doesn't back off from the law, the demands of the law, right? Does he? He intensifies the demands of the law in these books to display their need of a deliverer and a savior. I won't turn there, but Matthew chapter 5, 21 and 22, Matthew 5, 28, he makes it so they can't obey the law, doesn't he? If you even think it in your heart, it's sin. Okay. So, I got news for him. If you think that you can follow the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he tell you? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's he telling the Jews? He's not telling the Gentiles. What's he telling the Jews? You can't. He intensifies it so they can't. Why is he doing that? Well, it's the time of their visitation. Who's finally come? And what has the law? Faith plus works. What is it taught? They need a deliverer. So he intensifies the law to bring them to him. Israel, the circumcision, not the church, the body of Christ. We'll start next week and we're going to talk about new creature rule. New creature rule. Okay?